Um, this is joint work with like Tire Lab South Africa and then we from Oakland. So today we're going to be examining two different implementations of the Minimal Wood Wall, um, along with Laura. And so we called it a tale of two tongues because the Minimal Wood Wall is like a tongue twister in the Harry Potter universe. Um, so the goal here is to describe why like, privacy matters, again, as you guys already know. Um, how we should examine and explore privacy in blockchains. We'll do a high-level intro to Mimble Wimble, talk about how the transactions work, the privacy guarantees, the privacy guarantees it doesn't provide. Um, then we'll compare Grin and Beam, which are two separate implementations of Mimble Wimble that roughly came alive January 2018, so they've been going on for a while. And then we'll talk about the importance of implementation. Because even though they're both the same protocol at its core, they have slightly different like, privacy guarantees due to their implementation. So why does privacy matter? The, four, four, the number one reason for me is really fungibility of coins. Let's say we have, if, if we look at Bitcoin, new coins, virgin coins, are perceived as more valuable than coins that have traveled around. And if you have coins from, let's say, the dark net market, using that coin, let's say, that change would be a lot more difficult. So people are afraid of what you've done with that coin in the past or where you've gotten it from, through either illicit gains or conventional means. Like, therefore, when coins are private, they're all fungible. Each coin is equal to each other. They're indistinguishable. So no longer you'll have coins either trading at a discount if you're negative or trading at a premium if you're positive. Um, a really fun reference in US history, if you want to explore the fungibility of coins during the free banking era. So the free banking era was roughly from the 1830s to the end of the Civil War. And this is when every single state could issue their own like, US dollars. So let's say we're in New York City and someone sends me a bill from Delaware. Like, okay, Delaware is kind of close by. Like, I've heard of this bank before. What type of discount should I apply to this bank? Should I take it, you know, 90 cents of a dollar? What if I had a bank here from Utah, somewhere like really far away? I'm like, okay, I've never heard of this bank before, but it looks sort of real. Should I give it 50 cents of a dollar, 60 cents of a dollar? I just don't know. So in that time period, it was really fun. You'd have something very similar to, I guess, like, you know, chain analysis or whatever. You'd have something called a bank of reporter. And this is a book you get every month that say, this bank, you should get, like, 90 cents on a dollar for this bank, note, or 80 cents on a dollar for this bank. Note. And this necessarily wasn't great for business, because every single time you'd want to transact with someone who was far away, you're like, okay, like, how valuable is there currency that they're giving me? And there's all this like idiosyncratic risk that you do not want to take on as a merchant. And this also creates a huge cottage, cottage industry of analysis companies, which on some perspective like, may be good. Like if Bitcoin was private, you probably wouldn't have chain analysis. So hard to say. <laughs> um, another reason why like Price and I was not is due to judgment free. Like, if you can do whatever you want to do with your money, it allows for experimentation. But if everyone is tracking every single transaction you make, you're a lot more careful what you do or how you spend your money. So let's say if you want to donate to some political cause, you do so, and if people can track this, this may have ramifications in your, you know, your day life or your work life. And so it really prevents experimentation. And second, your wealth, or perhaps lack of wealth, is determined by everyone else. So they can just go to blockchain and be like, hey, you have this number amount of uh, like coins in your wallet, like maybe he's a target, or maybe this person should avoid. Like, being able to determine someone's wealth is like, not great, and it creates a lot of like, personal like, safety issues for the individual. And like, perhaps even better, and really relevant to our day to day, is that you no longer have like, data mining and personal data. Look at like Venmo or like PayPal or WeChat or Paytm. Like all these platforms log every single like transaction that you make. And like they're explicit business models to understand like how you're spending your money to give you better ads. And maybe if you want better ads, using these platforms are ideal. But if you want to have privacy in what you're doing, we should. This is why we have like privacy points. And something like more nuanced is truly censorship-resistant transactions. 
So even people call Bitcoin censorship resistant and call like any cryptocurrency censorship resistant, but if all the miners exclude against you, they're like, okay, we know this transaction is coming from address A, so we're not going to process any transaction. Or we know that you know this person is sending money to like person B, and like this person B is on this watch list, so we're just going to ignore this transaction. Um, in the past, this didn't really matter because it was really easy for people to be, to be miners in the network, especially if hash rates really low. But given that like most blockchains have really high hash rates, it's very inconceivable for the, the average individual to become a miner to get to ensure that the transaction is included. So if you have a privacy coin, you're not able to identify who's a sender and who's a recipient. You cannot have a cabal of miners who send the transactions. So actually, like in EOS, you have this like blacklist that all the stakers follow, and so like you will have accounts that are locked. You can no longer send money unless some random like block producer accidentally includes them. Um, guess like you, which has happened, and then that block producer later like lost all their stake because they accidentally included a transaction they weren't supposed to include. Um, like this is something we cannot have on the network that we all consider like, permissionless and like censorship resistant. So this is kind of a rough like BS list if we like pull it together recently. It's like how do we think about privacy, which is important for when we analyze like mobile limbo, different mobile limbo implications. So you want to look at like transaction data. Like is it chain data? Is that immutable? Um, what about like provable like chain state? So if our adversary is spying on the blockchain in the entire history or always spying on blockchain during NFT, having a provable state state is what we find. Um, is transaction construction private? Um, what's well, it's more of a global, is a very unique transaction format? Um, what about transaction count? Like, can we, are we able to infer how many transactions have occurred within a block? Um, this is important for like, some particular use cases. Um, and then, like, transaction existence. Then, something that's ignored greatly is privacy on the network level, such as, like, transaction propagation. But perhaps even more importantly, block propagation. Can miners or stakers be private? Uh, like, so for the network maintainer, like, what is your privacy? And then, like, what about the wallet? Like, just because your currency is anonymous, if your wallet's not anonymous, kind of defeats the purpose. And then, like, what if you want things to be toggleable? Like, is privacy optional or is it default for everyone or default off? And so here's the fun part. Like, what is the What is like unique, novel, like private protocol that dropped an IRC in fact 2016? Um, so in like traditional blockchains, there's no concept of addresses. So we'll explore this more in detail. Um, it's private in the sense that the recipient, the sender, and the amounts are private, um, but not the fee. So we'll go into that a little bit later. Um, and it's a compact blockchain. You use something called a cut through, which is very similar to consumption to coin join that can occur over time and it helps reduce the blockchain chain state, which is helpful for privacy under certain conditions. Um, so here's a fun time. So back in August 2016, there was like anonymous French Voldemort. His name was like Tom Elvis Gisador. Um, he dropped an original paper into BTC's research RC channel and the papers with some important services. Kind of just like put that out there. No one really knows who this person is. Kind of, kind of reminds us of like the Bitcoin days or the Bitcoin white paper just by on this person. It was kind of nice. So back to not knowing who your creators are. Um, in October, in the Palestra, there's a block stream like into the paper. Um, you did some like security updates, helped the cryptography out, and also like a small bug fix. Um, and, like in November, the same year, this guy called Ignatius, um, he's actually like in Harry Potter, the original owner of the Visible Cloak. He starts Grin, um, which is the first implementation of Mobile Limbo, and he puts this on GitHub. So let's explore like what a Mobile Limbo transaction is. Um, here we're going to, instead of like, talking about the cryptography, we're going to talk about the interactions. So if we think about a normal like Bitcoin or Monero or nearly every other cryptocurrency transaction out there, we know someone's address. We like sign a local message and we submit it to the network. Like we do not need to interact with like Bob or like some other third party. However, in a Mimbo Limbo, it's very different. So Alice first constructs a transaction and sends it to Bob. So Bob receives this transaction and like countersigns it and sends it back. Then Alice has to finalize this transaction, so the third step, before submitting it to the network. 
Um, so there are some issues here, like due to contractivity that we'll explore. So the first one is like it's a free option for the sender. So Alice could initially send a transaction to Bob, get a message back, and be like, actually, you know, I didn't want to send you this money, and just like toss it out. And Bob's just waiting there for the money to come that will never come. Um, so the sender like is on the counter side, which gives you a free option. Uh, something more fun maybe could be considered a feature is that the sender can actually create several messages for like multiple individuals and whoever like signs fast with the money. So you have some like race condition. Uh, but I can see this be very fun if you want to do like an airdrop, like here's a transaction, this first one you claim it wins it. And it's something you, you can't really do natively in other protocols, so like that could be a really interesting feature. Um, then we have an like, interactivity requirement. Um, so here, both Alice and Bob need to be online at some period of time to communicate. Um, this actually gets worse with multi-party computations. Uh, sorry, multi-party transactions. We're doing like Alice, Alice with Bob and Carol. Then like all three participants need to be online. Um, the receiver also must countersign by a certain block height. So there's some like time involved. So like the counterparts offline for a long period of time, and problems will arise. And even worse, there's like a man in the middle attack. Um, so, Alice creates a message that sends the ball, but if someone intercepts it, they're able to countersign and insert their own like, spend key and claim that money, and Alice has no idea whether Bob has received the money or not. All Alice knows is like, I sent the money, and the transaction got, you know, like, approved by miners. And Bob's like, I don't have my money. And they're like, what? What happened here? Um, so therefore, like, these messages must be encrypted, and this is the very first message that sent to Bob. Um, and then Wimble as a protocol itself does not like, provide any like suggestions or solutions on how to actually encrypt this message. And what's we'll explore how like Grin and Wimble, Wimble is Grin and Bean both handle this issue or feature depending on how you look at it. Let's talk about some of the privacy constraints here. Um, first, by having no addresses, it makes it hard to like transact. Um, actually, we're talking about this. So let's talk about cut through really quickly. Cut through removes outputs from the transaction pool that's already been spent. Uh, for example, let's say we have like, like input like x1, it goes like a1, like output one, output two. Um, then we're able to like merge them together, so like less outputs. Uh, so the benefit here is that you have small blocks and also improves privacy if your adversary is just looking at the blockchain from like a certain time. Um, however, because you have like archival nodes, like maybe like, this doesn't really help price that much, and like Kafka is more beneficial. So it's just to sync the blockchain faster because it may sort of state. Um, the downside of Kafka is that the kernel access still exists, so you know how many transactions occur. Um, you're just not able to link things together as well. And so let's talk about privacy limitations. Um, you know, nothing is perfect. And, we like we try we try to be as you know, private as possible. Um, but in the Wimble, the number of inputs and outputs are revealed on a per block basis. Um, so this generally doesn't matter. Say you have like hundred transactions because you'll perhaps have like hundreds or two hundred, three hundred of like inputs and outputs. You can't really link them together. However, let's say there's only one transaction in the block. You're like, okay, we have like three inputs and two outputs. Like of course they're linked together if you only have one transaction. Um, which is potentially problematic. And so Grin right now has very little transaction throughput. So like linking like inputs and outputs is trivial on Grin. Um, Beam has a lot more transactions. I'm not sure it's because they're just like faking, like, faking transactions because they include that somewhere in their paper. Uh, you you want to add decoys. Um, but this linkage like, is an issue. You can also do like tainted coins. You can send someone over a particular like, output and see what they use down the line. Um, Number of transactions are revealed via the kernel count. So, if the number of transactions weren't revealed, then the linkage of inputs and outputs would be more difficult. Uh, however, because like transactions count are revealed, then it's problematic. The fees of individual transactions are also revealed on a per transaction basis. Um, so, right now, the status quo is not an issue because blocks are not full, so people just use a default fee. But you know, if blocks are full, different clients may have different implementations for fee, for fee estimation. So you can kind of work out, like, okay, this person used wallet A or wallet B because 
their algorithm produces this type of feed. And then you can also tell like if transactions are being more urgent than others, because someone put like a manual, like a manual really high feed, you're like, okay, like, I wonder who this is. So these are some of the limitations that you need to be aware of when you're transacting. So if you want to, if we're assuming blocks are full, um, maybe the first two aren't really too, too much of an issue. Um, and then just make sure you use a wallet that's very standard or that there's a standardized like, fee selection process so you don't get isolated. Um, so these are the two different types of the mobile. So we have like Grin, which is a beautiful face, and Beam, which looks like a laser. Um, so these both launched really closely to each other. Grin actually was working, was developing first, and then Beam came along slightly later. Uh, Grin is led by an anonymous team, roughly four individuals. Be sorry, Grin is roughly anonymous and four individuals, and then Beam is a whole team out of Israel. Um, the block times are roughly the same, the proof of work, slightly different like, algorithms, but they're both meant to be like ASIC resistance for now. And one of the in Rust is C. It's just like random differences. Um, so actually this is not a technical difference. They both implement, we'll go to like what they have in common more. Uh, but like when they go implement like Dandelion++, plus plus, there's like some slight differences with it. Like Grin is transaction aggregation and capture the stem phase, um, which requires slightly more anonymity. And then like B, like as much dummy transactions, which is actually probably why B, if you go to Beam's Explorer, they have a lot more transaction counts or transactions because there's a lot of dummy ones. And yeah, it's interesting because Beam will have I feel like 100 transactions per block. So I wonder like how much of that is actually dummy transactions. Compared to the real transactions. Um, so, I have some like unique features of Grin, they have like some like classic, unique proof of work. Um, they actually, like, in both protocols, plan to ship the ASIC system in two years. This is relatively like, unrelated to like privacy at all. Uh, so, let's skip this. Beam's unique features, I find this like more interesting. Um, they have a concept of like an audible wallet. So, you imagine like a narrow you know, transaction with view key. So Audible Wallet is effectively, a, you can see it as a view key for Beam. Um, however, this must be enabled by the end user. So if you don't enable Audible, Audible, Audible Wallet, no one will be able to infer that you've had transactions or not. Um, Beam also has a unique feature to reduce the number of like, kernel transactions, which is the chain state. Um, and then Beam's approach for setting this securely is to be called a secure bulletin board system, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's like a bulletin board that everyone can do, which seems kind of odd. So there's like a shared message board where people just put encrypted messages on, and people will try to decrypt these messages, which in my opinion seems really efficient, but if it's all in one place, maybe you can't do like, like network analysis on like where the messages are propagating and going. Um, so like it sort of works ish. Um, and then there's like some like miscellaneous differences that we probably should explore because this will affect not necessarily privacy. And I think over time you realize like it's more than just the privacy primitives that the protocol implements that really determines its success. Like we need to understand like what is like the monetary policy, what is like the governance, what does the community believe, like what is the mining environment look like, what is like the technical nuances, like what are the directions of the teams going. Like for example, Grin is really weird where Grin did not have a, like Grin did not raise external funding, they just took donations, whereas like he raised like venture capital and like private investors. So Grin's like, okay, we have like no money. And investors are like, okay, we really want to get exposure to Grin, but we can't get the money. So what can we do? Because we can't donate money, so we can't get anything from that. Um, so instead we're going to invest in like mining pools specifically for Grin. So you have a bunch of investors who's like dump the money into SPV mining, like uh, social purpose vehicles for mining, and which is how they got exposure to it. It's like, okay, it's kind of a really roundabout way to get, you know, like good points. Like maybe Beam is more efficient from raising like external capital and having these people get a proportion of the founders world like Zcash. Um, so these are just like political differences and like, and that both protocols kind of made. And when I think of Grin versus Beam, I kind of think of Monero versus Zcash. Right? Like Monero took no extra money, it was like Zcash sold a portion of the founders of the war, um, which could be problematic, who knows. Um, and then the supply side, like Grin is a similar to Monero where you have like 
linear, infinite, infinite tail inflation. Um, but Grin actually has a very high inflation at the beginning, and so it takes off and like, approaches zero as time goes on. Um, Beam has like, a fixed supply. Like, whether this matters in the short term or long term, who knows? Um, but there's just some like, ideological differences. Um, like Beam also has a halving, and some people believe halvings are very unstable for prices near a half a period, whereas Grin doesn't have this, maybe Grin is more stable. Like, who knows? We don't really know. Um, they also use like, different databases for the transactions. Grin actually used to use RocksDB, but then they realized that LMDB was better, which is awesome because what Monero uses. Um, Beam uses like, SQLite. It probably doesn't really matter. Like, both these databases are very similar, and probably doesn't affect the protocol that much. Like the mempool representation of data, it's like, okay, they're both different ways of doing it, but probably doesn't make much of a difference. That's just in terms of privacy. Um, so the question is like, which protocols to see? Like they're both the same mempool Google protocol. They all have very, s the baseline of like, privacy guarantees, but because they have different monetary policy, like mining, like practice of mining pools are very different, and maybe there's like technical nuances, like, okay, like which one will be more likely to be successful, and which one will win long term. Like we don't really know, we can guess, we can compare like Zcash and Monero, and like work backwards from there, but who knows? And I like to put a shameless plug. Um, if you want to like, learn more about this content that our research team did, go to tlu.com, this is Tari Labs University, and this is where we put our research team all this up. Um, so if you have any questions, like feel free to ask. Yes. One more time. Oh, oh, so, oh, so how does Alice identify Bob? This is great. So in order to find your counterpart you're transacting with, you actually need to add a band. So in, in Beam, you'll be like, okay, this is my private public key pair. And you like send it to like Alice, like, hey, this is my public key, like encrypt the message, like, encrypt it. So like, encrypt your message to my public key. Um, Grin doesn't really have any like standard way of doing it, so you have to do it all out of band. Um, like maybe this is okay. Like, you're like, you're, like transacting over like secure messenger. You're like okay, this is my public key. Like just encrypt it to this and like send the information over this channel. Um, but let's say have like you know like a unified like, one way of doing it. There's a lot of issues where you can have leakage or like some end of attack. So this is problematic, especially given that Grin doesn't have a standard way of doing it. That is not an area of my expertise, but I can link you later. It, it may not be true. Man, this red was really tired of some 4 a.m. Yeah. Perfect, thank you.